So we do have Bill Davidge, and Bill is a friend of mine of over 15 years. We met through a charity event. We had a uh, foursome for the charity event with the Dispatch Wolf Charities. We had a celebrity join each foursome. It was really nice that we had a powerful golfer and became fast friends that day 15 years ago and have carried through that, that relationship. Uh, I reached out to Bill in May and said, hey, we've got a hockey season coming up. Let's get you on the calendar. So Bill Davidge, everyone knows the Columbus Blue Jackets, but he'll tell you some great information about the Blue Jackets, what their prospects are for this year, what their attendance was the first game, they're three and two for the season. And like the crew, that is an ongoing challenge to save the crew. Think of supporting the Jackets as well. Those two franchises do a lot for our city at large to our offerings. So do think of supporting the Jackets. Bill and I have something very much in common. I did not play hockey for The Ohio State University as Bill did. I'm not from Ontario. But Bill did make it back to my alma mater, alma mater the Miami University. And in Oxford, Ohio, not the one in Florida. And at the Miami University, he was an assistant hockey coach, and his first wife was an assistant uh, tennis coach or head tennis coach. And when people deal with adversity in life, it's part of their story as well. He's not here just to talk about jackets, he's here as a human being. His wife was killed taking a recruit back to the airport. They had one young son that, that he's raised since. Bill also, four years ago this summer, came down with multiple um, myeloma. He's not just a survivor, he's a battler and a fighter, and he takes care of many others in the battle today. Bill Davidge, analyst, TV commentator, coach, scout, anything else you do for the Jackets, Bill? I gotta clean the floors when I get back. <laughs> okay. I thought I was coming in today, Callaway, and talk Ohio State football and the crew. <laughs> You know, there's a lot of success stories around here, and I think, uh, again, with what the crew just went through, and it looks like things are going to turn around there and, and encompass this city because it's, uh, it is special. Uh, the Ohio State Buckeyes, uh, they snuck one out. I'm a, again, I am a Buckeye, and uh, I do pay attention. My, uh, my late father-in-law played football here for Woody back in the 50s. In fact, he still has a record at The Ohio State University with four touchdowns and 12 receptions in a game. And then it was that next year when Woody brought in the three yards in a cloud of dust. And uh, he and Woody didn't see eye to eye his junior and senior year by any means. In fact, when I met my wife, Leanne, at Ohio State, she was a tennis player. In fact, she was the first woman ever inducted into uh, the Ohio State uh, Hall of Fame. She was a, uh, a tennis player. She was a competitor. And I can remember I started dating her in uh, my sophomore year. And uh, I'm sitting out in the stands, and Woody would always come out of the North facility and go over to practice. Well, he saw me sitting up there, and he comes up. He says, hey, kid, who are you looking at? And I said, uh, Leanne Grimes. Uh, he jumped up into the stands. He says, let me tell you something. Look at that jaw. Look at that jaw, that girl. He says, I know her dad, and he is a competitor. He hates to lose, and I bet you she's the same way. So you better know what you're getting yourself into. Right? <laughs> <clears throat> well, since that time, my late wife, uh, Leanne, uh, she is in, like I say, Ohio State's Hall of Fame. She is in uh, Miami's Hall of Fame as a tennis coach. And uh, her son, my son, Rob, works downtown here, uh, lives right in Burnham working with Jeff Logan with Skylight Financial. And uh, Rob is one of probably the top city golfers in the state. He qualified for the U.S. Mid-Am this year and uh, has done a real nice job. He's a three-time club champ the last three years at Brookside. If, and uh, he's just getting his business around where now his golf game is starting to pick up. <laughs> That's one thing I tell him. He said he wanted to get into the golf business when he was a kid. And I said, that's great. OK, let's do it. 10th grade, I sent him out. And we lived on the golf course. He would go and open up the shop, and he'd have to close the shop at 10 o'clock that night. At the end of that summer, he says, Dad, I don't think I really want to get into that golf business. <laughs> he says, I don't have time to play. My point exactly. And so right now, he's able to go and, uh, and be part of something real special with a game that we, uh, we certainly truly love. Callaway talked about uh, being a Buckeye and, and being at Miami. Uh, I wanted to play pro hockey. As you can see, I'm vertically challenged, okay? 5'9", five, 5'10", five, I was about 170 pounds. My senior year, I had three concussions, but I was also a 3'8 student at The Ohio State University, and I thought, you know what? Let's do something with this. 
Uh, had a buddy that was going to school at Miami, and I ended up following suit, went to grad school, became a graduate uh, teaching assistant, had my master's degree paid for, and was able to, uh, to start a hockey program along with Steve Cady back in 1976-77, uh, and it was three years later that went varsity, and I think if anybody has followed college hockey now at Miami, <clears throat> it's probably the number one sport going, and with the support that they have, it's, it's really nice to see. And uh, like I say, that's going back, that's going back a few years uh, that I was there, that I was there. I had uh, the opportunity, after Leanne passed away, I tried to raise Robbie. He was, he was uh, 13 months old at that time when, he, when she passed away. So I can remember carrying a diaper bag over one shoulder and recruiting and driving to Toronto. And he's in the car seat. He's asleep from Oxford to Detroit. I'd wake him up, we'd stop in Windsor and get some McDonald's. He'd go back to sleep again, get to, to my, my hometown in Dunville, Ontario, and we'd sit and recruit for two or three days. I got him a little sport coat. I got him some spats. He walked in, and he was the best damn recruiter I ever had. <laughs> and he was, he was certainly something special, and he's, he's a guy today that has helped me with my, uh, with my fight with cancer. <clears throat> it's a cancer you can't cure. It's called multiple myeloma. In fact, I go in tomorrow morning and have, uh, I get my blood work checked every two months. I uh, was diagnosed 2014. A year later, I had a bone marrow transplant. I'd, uh, and since that time, in fact, it's, it's been 16 months that I am in remission. <laughs> a lot of reasons for that. Uh, the people at the James have done a great job with my uh, oncologist, Dr. Benson. Uh, they have been just top-notch, uh, but also, uh, again, I praise the Lord for what we get each and every day. Uh, the power of prayer has been able to keep me going, and I'll be, uh, I'll be honest with you, I share that with everybody. Because, again, you can't go a day without respecting what you have. And I've got the best darn job in the world. I've got the best family in the world. And uh, I'm being part of the greatest game in the world. And that's uh, work, working and being part of the Columbus Blue Jackets. I stayed on in the faculty at Miami University uh, from, uh, well, it was 1977 until 1998. And at that time, Doug McLean came in and took over as the, uh, the new general manager, coach, eventually, of the Columbus Blue Jackets. We had worked together, and I did it on a part-time basis when I was on the faculty at Miami working with the Detroit Red Wings and working with the Florida Panthers. I did broadcasting in Cincinnati. I was positioned and stationed in Oxford, Ohio, and I uh, got out of coaching in 89, continued on for another nine, 10 years, and that's when the opportunity came to, uh, to be able to come to Columbus and be part of it. How many guys remember a guy by the name of Johnny Pont in this room? Johnny Pont was a very good friend of mine. Johnny Pont is in the cradle of coaches at Miami University. And I can remember sitting and we were playing golf. I lived on the golf course in Oxford, walking down the fourth fairway. And I told Johnny, he says, you know, Billy, I, or you know, John, I said, I got a chance right now to go full time and be part of something in building in Columbus. He stopped me right in my tracks, grabbed me by the shoulders. He said, Bill, if you ever want to go back to Miami, you can do that. But you've got an opportunity right now to make a difference in a city that is just embracing itself to the game of hockey. And from that day on, I took a, I wasn't quite sure yet, I took a two-year leave of absence from Miami. They gave me that opportunity and basically welcomed me to go back if I didn't like it. But at that time, we negotiated, and that was in 1999, and I have been here ever since and been part, uh, been part of it all. I was a second hire for Doug McLean, along with the scouts, the rest of the people I scouted the first year, and then started on the radio with George Matthews and have since moved uh, in the booth, out of the booth, and now because of the cancer, I, uh, I'm still able to do what I love to do, and that's sit and talk about hockey. Uh, each and every night I do the pregame show. Between periods, I, I use the Telestrator. I'm a teacher by trade and a coach by trade. And my job to me, and it has been since the, I came in 99, is to let people know what the game of hockey is, where it's going, what we can do to make it better, and I think for everybody in this room, knowing that uh, you're Rotarians and, and really the, the power of paying forward, much like what Woody used to say, you always pay forward. The Blue Jackets have been able to do that. 
In fact, they have gone over $10.4 million in endowments given back to local hockey teams, local charities that basically emphasize children, youth, and sport, as well as safety and, uh, and other programs, pediatric uh, cancer at the, the James. So the Jackets have really uh, been involved with this community uh, and continue to, to get better. The team ourself, our, ourself right now uh, in looking at what we've been able to accomplish, first of all, let me say this, we have a, uh, how, in fact, how many people have been to a Blue Jacket game in here? Put your hands up. How many have not? Ryan, we're going to get you there Thursday night. We just talked. <laughs> Told them, I said, you call the ticket office and tell them you want a Blue Jacket experience, okay? And make sure that they, uh, they follow up. If not, you and I are going to talk, okay? <laughs> but uh, I think everybody realizes what we have what we have in the city with that hockey team. Uh, it has been, I had brown hair when it started. <laughs> I have to sit and go on the air and I cannot fool anybody because in the beginnings, you know, it was tough, it was hard. We worked hard and that was my mantra. Oh, we worked hard tonight. Yeah, there's another hard working game. That's not good enough. You know, it, it really isn't good enough. And, and last, the last two or three years, we made, we've made consecutive playoff runs the last two years, three of the last four, but it's not even close to being good enough. If anybody watched the game on Saturday night in Tampa, so close yet so far. You know, we have a chance, we get to within 3-2 with 15 seconds left in that second period. What does Tampa do? They score, make it 4-2, and then the gates opened up and we got hammered. Three power play goals given up, we got hammered 8-2. That's why I wanted to talk about Ohio State football and <laughs> today. <laughs> Although that can be a lot better too, can it not? Uh, but the, the one positive is that we've had a culture change since we brought in a guy by the name of John Davidson as our president of hockey operations. He brought in the first European general manager in Jarmo Kekalainen out of Finland. They worked together in St. Louis. And they have uh, used the mantra brick by brick in building this hockey team to what it is today. And it is getting better. It is one that can compete. Uh, last year, I mean, as an example, we're playing Washington, the eventual Stanley, Stanley Cup uh, champions. And we beat them twice in their building, both games into overtime. We've got them right where we want them. We bring them back home and lose three consecutive. And then they win the fourth back in, uh, in Washington. It was uh, certainly disappointing, but I think, again, you know, learning, learning by, by mistakes, learning by losing, you've got to be able to take hold of it and hopefully build that into something positive. And I think that's where right now our culture is set with this hockey team to be able to take that next step. The city needs it. You need it. I certainly need it. The players need it. The staff, everybody involved needs it. This is a team, and this is a city right now, that they're used to winning. They're finding ways to win. And the Jackets have been close, but it's not close enough yet. John Tortorella will be the first guy to tell you that we've got to take another step to be better, and it all starts. It starts in your net. It starts in your net. And the coach and John Tortorella in, in helping change this culture around, he doesn't hide the fact that we're not good enough. He meets it head on. And he closes the door. And after last spring meetings, there were a few guys not very happy, one of them being our Vesna Trophy winner, the best goaltender in the league last year in Sergei Bobrovsky. And right now, if you take a look at Bob's game, it, it's got to be better. But I think, too, he, is, he and a guy by the name of Artemi Panarin are two unrestricted free agents. They have both mentioned to the Columbus Blue Jackets that we're not going to talk about contract during the course of the season. Well, the course of the season has started. Uh, Artemi Panarin is probably uh, the best hockey player I have seen in person in my years in the game. He's about 5'10", he's about 175 pounds, and he's got no quit. But he becomes an unrestricted free agent as of July 1st next year. He has an opportunity to go someplace of his desire. Now, both he and Bobrovsky are in that same boat. And I know right now that uh, the word is that Bob would like to go to a major area or Bob would like to go to Florida where some of his buddies are playing either with the Florida Panthers or Tampa Bay, but also L.A. and New York, they're all coming into play. 
we're not going to worry about it. Since you can't negotiate and you can't, we can't worry about it. I talked to Yarmo Kekalainen this morning and said, I was coming to speak here uh, today. Uh, what can I tell, what can you tell him? Tell him he's a Columbus Blue Jacket. Tell the people he's a Columbus Blue Jacket. He is a Columbus Blue Jacket. I'm going to tell you what, he is something to watch. Sergey Bobrovsky has got to step up his game a little bit and uh, be able to hopefully uh, keep us on the winning track. As, as Callaway said, we're three and two right now. Uh, we still have 77 games to go, and uh, I can see the best coming out with this Blue Jacket team. It, it hit us a little hard in the beginning here because we lost Seth Jones, one of our top defensemen with this hockey team, and we also lost Brandon Dubinsky, who was coming off of a, a personal low last year and a lot of different things, uh, not only dealing with personal issues, but also his, his statistics and everything else. He came back in great shape, and uh, he ends up getting hurt in the first game and has been unable to, uh, to, to continue. So we're hoping we get these two guys back. But on a positive vein, uh, looking at some of our young players that we have, uh, we are the youngest hockey team in the National Hockey League right now. We are also a team that we have got more wins since 2016. In fact, we have fourth in the league in wins in the last three years. And yet we have done simply nothing. We've got to find a way to win in that second season so that we can take that next step in bringing that little silver thing back in. And uh, I've already got a pencil route around nationwide and around the city for Lord Stanley when he does make his way here, uh, hopefully eventually sooner than later. But uh, a lot of positives. This week, we've got the Philadelphia Flyers on Thursday night, a home game. We don't go on the road for another 10, 11 days. Uh, it's a week from Thursday that they get back out on the road again. But two home games here back to back, Thursday, Saturday night against the Chicago Blackhawks. I know there are, are tickets to be, uh, to be bought and held. Uh, please come in and, and support our, our, our hockey team because there's a lot of positives that we have. One of the things that I've always found too when I come to a group, question and answer, and, uh, and I'll take any question and you'll, you'll take any answer. <laughs> How about a question uh, to start it off? Ryan, you're coming out of Philadelphia. You've got to have a question about Philly and uh, the Jackets and, and what we have. No? You think of something, OK? Yeah. Matt Calvert got that standing, uh, I, I guess it's standing over there. You got the elevation last Tuesday. Yeah. And then things got a little chippy in the third period. What happened then? Question was about Matt Calvert. We, uh, you know, when somebody leaves and somebody's been part of your organization, in fact, he was, uh, he was the old season veteran. He was here for eight years, and uh, everything continued uh, on. They did a nice tribute. Matt didn't even want to look at it. You know, they put it on the, uh, the during the game. Matt, Matt says, let's do those things before the game and after the game, but during the game, i got to play hockey. Things got chippy, but that's Matt. That's why you hated to see Matt Calvert leave, but, you know, he's got to take care of his family, and he ends up moving along with Ian Cole from last year's hockey team he ends up moving on to uh, Colorado, but uh, you know he's got a big heart. You know he's five foot ten as well, five eleven, and just a great big heart. He competes, and whether they're his best friends or not, you know what you're going to get back in turn. Yeah. You've got a lot of blowback about the non-paper tickets, uh, including threats of not re-upping next year yep. and so on. How's that going to get handled? You know what? I'm not in the ticket office, but I'm I'm the same way as you are. I've got the non-ticket, and I don't like it because. Again, when I, I'm calling, my friends that I give tickets to aren't from around here. They come in from out of town and they don't have the app on their phone. So I've gone through this with our ticket people and they're in the process. Right now, I think there's only, we're only just, we're the fourth last team to adopt this, pol this policy as far as tickets are concerned from what I understand. But uh, they're going, they're working through that right now because I know the, uh, the feedback is, is, it is strong. It is really strong. So let's hope everybody's going to be taken care of. Others, yeah. What if we're in a, a playoff hunt towards the end of the season? Do you, what do you think the Blue Jackets will do with Panarin in that position? That's a great question, and that's I say that every day. Uh, and that's where I think what you have to look at is what has he been through this year? We know what he's been able to do in the past. What's he been through this year? Uh, and come February, when the trade deadline comes, you. Do you hang on to him and make a run to the Stanley Cup? That means if we're going to keep him, that means we're pretty serious about winning the Cup. If we're at that point in February and it doesn't appear 
that the jackets are going to move any further or they're in a state of so-called flux with uh, uh, with the you know the salary and the, the, the budget that he'll want I think you'll see him end up being traded and uh, but what you're going to see if it is a trade my belief is you're not going to trade for draft picks or young you're going to trade for somebody that's going to come in two or three guys that are going to come in people remember the Rick Nash trade do you remember that was part of that trade, some of those players? It was the Dubinskys and the Anisimovs. And that was a kickstart for the Blue Jackets to get out of the doldrums and make, a, make their way up. Here's another critical area. I'm just hoping that Cam Atkinson and Dubois and these guys that are playing with him every day can convince him, if we're playing that well, look at what you are and how close we are to bringing home a Stanley Cup. And to me, any player that plays this game that's what you play for. They've got enough. All these guys have got enough money. So why don't you play for something that means in, you know, bigger than anything else you can ever have, and that's a victory in that Stanley Cup under your wing. So let's, ho let's hope we get to that situation, and he decides at that time, you know, I'm sticking around. But I know that right now the team wants to be able to continue and play well and, and do what you can do. Yeah. You've been involved in hockey for quite a while, and you've seen lots of changes that come forth with the game. Uh, where do you see the game going from here? Good question. Wants to know the game has, has changed, and right now uh, the game has changed so much that I believe that we've got the best product. Uh, you're getting the little guy back in the game again, the guys that can skate, the skilled players that can skate. How many people remember the Broad Street Bullies in the 70s? Okay. I played hockey at the Ohio State University in that little barn over there at 185 feet by 80 feet, and I got the nose to prove it and the shoulders to prove it. I've had 17 surgeries to put myself, I thought I was 6'4", 225, <laughs> and I tried to go through everybody. But that game is no longer around anymore. You don't have the Jody Shelleys. And Jody does a great job on TV, and he says, Billy, I got out at the right time. Yeah, you did because the game has changed so much, the speed, and they're not holding you up from getting in on top of the forecheck. Now what you've got to do, how many watched that hit of Tom Wilson on the young Swede at the beginning of the year that cost him $1.2 million? 20 games with a salary, and there's no more head hunting. There's no more, uh, you know, just illegal use of the body or the head targeting, much like in football and, and hockey, it's, it's out. It's a speed game. Uh, there's no red line, which I like. You can move up the ice. The puck moves a heck of a lot faster than any feet. And to me, it's a game when you watch it in person, you get, you get acclimated. You want to go back and see a little bit more. And if you can, get down near the ice, get as close to the ice and feel the speed of these guys and how physical it actually is. Because it's certainly, uh, it's embracing. It really is. Other questions? Other question. Yeah. The Winter Classic, when are we going to get that at the shoot? <laughs> well, I said in 1999, before they even had the first one, would it not be nice to put the rink at the shoe, have an afternoon game with Ohio State and Michigan in hockey, and that night play the Detroit Red Wings and the Blue Jackets? But, <laughs> but, I also am a good friend with Gene Smith, and back in uh, well, even Andy Geiger brought it to his attention, and there was no interest. I think right now, the uh, uh, Gary Bettman, the president of the National Hockey League, has already kind of let people know that that is on the radar. But there's a lot of things that you have to do in working with The Ohio State University to ever see something like that happen. So I know right now there's talks. Let's hope it happens sooner than later. Yes. Bill, uh, assuming the team stays together and aren't any major trades and the team stays relatively healthy for the rest of the season, what do you see the ceiling? What do you see the ceiling? A ceiling can be, I think this team could win a cup. I really do. I, I don't think there's any question. Bob's got to return to form, number one. Number two, we've got to hopefully stay healthy throughout the course of the year. The way the game is being played, the Washington Capitals, are they that much better than we were last year? Not a chance. Yet they won, and they went all the way to the cup. And to me, and, and Tort says the same thing, it, this is mental. This game isn't the physical, it's the mentality and how you handle and play 60 minutes of hockey. You've got to basically have a little bit of focus and have a little bit more accountability, 
when you get on the ice. Understand there's 60 minutes in a game, and sometimes 60 plus. But I, I really feel that for the first time in, in our, since I've been around this team since 98, 99, putting it together, this is the best chance we've had. And there's no reason why they can't. Yeah. What does the players feel about the city? You know, when we're sitting out there, do they feel that? Well, let me say this. A lot of those guys, the question was, what do the players think about the city? A lot of these players come back and are part of the community. And that's why you can see now with our foundation and the money, they just gave away $1.3 million uh, from our foundation to these local charities and, and youth hockey, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, all these guys have come back and are paying forward and vol volunteering their time. I just heard a rumor. Do you, how many people remember uh, uh, Hitchcock, our coach? Well, Hitch apparently sent a note. He's looking for a rental downtown for nine months of the year, and then three months of the year he's heading back to the desert. What's that tell you? There's, people want to stay in the city. People want to be part of the city. And you've got the, uh, to me, you've got the best restaurants. You've got the best communities. I love it when you can go around, and if we start, I moved down to Grove City when I was diagnosed with cancer because I, I needed to be closer to the hospital, but Grove City, what a, what a gem that we've got there. And move it to Hilliard, to Upper Arlington, to Hilliard, all the way around the Beltway. This is as good as it gets. We need a new rink in, in Grove City too. That would be nice. But uh, when you've got, we, we, you know, we're educating, I think, a, 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 a group of people in the city that first of all want to see winners, but they want to see it done right. And that's why I think the players come back and want to stay here because they want to see it done right. And that's been the mantra since, uh, since John H. Pa McConnell bought this hockey team way back when and fooled everybody and told them, hey, you can do what you want, but we're going to have a hockey team here. You know, the vote didn't go that way, but John H. McConnell said, don't worry, Gary Bettman, stay with me. We are going to have the money to be able to make sure this happens. And when you've got support from an ownership and then you get the support of a team that can compete, that's all you need. That's all you need. But now we've got to gain the respectability and win. Winning does everything, no matter what we do. Yeah. Uh, what, uh, what's the relationship with the Chillers? And how do you feel about that? I think it's great. That was one of the, what the relationship with the Chillers, the Blue Jackets, and that was one of the things that uh, John H. McConnell did. When they come in, they bought up the Chillers. They have also put a rink in Springfield. Uh, you know, there's talk of expanding and, and adding another facility up in uh, uh, Chiller North. But that's what you have to do. If you look in Dallas, Dallas did the same thing. If you look in San Jose, non-traditional hockey markets, get, make sure that you've got those facilities full because those little kids are your future ticket holders. When I, my first job, when Doug hired me to come in and help put the team together as a scout, Every Monday night, I would also come in and do clinics over at uh, Chiller Easton. It just basically helping with uh, teach officials how to referee, but also get the young kids on the ice and get them exposed. They just wanted to see Stinger. They could give a rat's rear end <laughs> about anything else in hockey, but Stinger was on the ice, you know? Any other questions? Well, listen, thanks for having me. Thanks for listening. I believe, I keep track too, Callaway, this is my fifth Upper Arlington Rotary since the year 2000. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you so much for coming to speak, Bill. Thanks for being a leadership of the Jackets and the community with your family and being a personal fighter in your own town. With that, be the inspiration. Thank you for coming today.